Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Voices of Music Therapy podcast. I'm your host, Brian Lacasio, and today's guest is a board-certified music therapist and the founder of a music therapy private practice, Your Song Music Therapy LLC, in Chicago, Illinois. They use she, they pronouns and receive their music therapy degree at Eastern Michigan University with a minor in women and gender studies. She has clinical experience in both acute and long-term inpatient mental health, forensic settings, substance use rehabilitation settings, and in private practice, supporting clients of various identities, ages, and abilities. She is passionate about providing music therapy services to the LGBTQIA2S plus community, those with mental health support needs, people with substance use support needs, children, seniors, and individuals in hospice care. Everyone, I am happy to introduce April Hickey. Hello, thank you so much for having me on today. Hello, and thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time. So one of the first questions I like to ask people who come on the show is how they define music therapy. We all have these different definitions, so it's amazing to hear individuals' takes on what it is we do. Yeah, I feel like every time I open my mouth to answer that question, something different comes out. So today I will say music therapy is the use of music by a credentialed professional to achieve wellness goals for people of all ages, abilities, and identities. That was great. And I love that it encompasses all individuals because we really do work across the spectrum. Absolutely. So now that we've kind of defined music therapy and also kudos, because that was the most concise answer I've heard like straightforward right off the bat. I have to admit that I practiced that a little bit. I was like, (laughs) (laughs) what led you to the profession? Oh, I always say that it was kind of fate for me because I grew up in a very rural, isolated area in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I had never even heard of music therapy, really. But I was always really interested in music. And it was my viola teacher that sent me to Eastern Michigan University um, because she really liked the string faculty there and thought it would be a good match for me. So I just went to Eastern because that's where my viola teacher sent me. Turns out that Eastern Michigan University is only one of two schools in the state of Michigan that even offers a music therapy program. My freshman roommate was in the music therapy program. So I was just kind of around a lot of people that were doing that. I thought it sounded really interesting. So I thought maybe I'll just take the intro class and see what happens. But it was really meant to be because I kind of just went into music school, not really knowing where I wanted to land. I just knew I wanted to do music. I knew I did not want to teach. Um, and I've always wanted to be in a helping profession. So it it was really just kind of meant to be. So I took the intro class and I was like, well, this is exactly what I should be doing. And, and now here I am. So I feel just so lucky that it worked out that way for me. Yeah. And it sounds like you were able to just transition into music therapy like your first year or was that like in the second year? It was in my second year. So I ended up taking five years to complete um, my music therapy program. Very cool. And it's it's awesome here. So it sounds like you were primarily a violist. Mm hmm. Ah, Yes. More string music therapists. Are you a string player as well, Brian? (laughs) I am not. I'm a I just played that. But I all my like close friends um or a lot of them in um college they they played strings and so that was the group that I hung out with (laughs) right on you know I love string players and that was really lucky for me because I felt I was able to make my way around a guitar pretty easy from that experience yeah absolutely it's it's amazing you know the the transfers that you can make between different instruments that was something that before I was really a musician it it seems so far-fetched and then once you're in the world it's like oh yeah this this transfers this all over like totally it becomes much easier yeah so you get you get your music therapy degree you go through internship what does it look like for you now that you've been practicing for a while um and during like covid also transitioning out of covid totally so my music therapy journey has been i guess a little bumpy i was really you know set on going into inpatient mental health. That's what I did my internship in. And I, I really loved that. And that was actually my first job in the field as well was in inpatient, um, acute mental health. And, you know, I really, really loved that work, but I found that 
working in American healthcare brought many challenges to me that made it really difficult for me to stay in that position. So moving forward from that, I felt I just had to figure out self-employment in some way. It's tough because a lot of people in private practice for music therapy maybe don't see as much mental health um, work coming to them, but that really is my passion. So my caseload has looked small <laughs> since I've started in private practice, but, but it's been great. And I've got some exciting things lined up, um, some cool partnerships with friends doing you know different nonprofits around the city and that kind of thing. During the pandemic, I was holding on to my small caseload on Zoom and it's been really wonderful to see my clients in person again. That's been a wild transition really. I feel like in the past month since I've been seeing particularly one client in person, we've been only jamming and improv because we haven't been able to really do that for the past year over Zoom. So that has been wonderful to be able to do that. Moving ahead, I'm, I'm open to a lot of different possibilities for music therapy. I'm working on getting into a homeless shelter that a friend works at to provide services there. I'm really excited about that. I feel like that's kind of the closest that I can find to my inpatient psych <laughs> setting so far. And, and yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunities in this moment right now after the pandemic. I think there's a lot of people that are seeking out mental health support and especially mental health support that looks a little untraditional. And I think music therapy can step into that perfect place right there. So I've been finding when I'm pitching music therapy to different places, you don't have to say a whole lot for people to be really on board of like, oh yeah, that actually sounds awesome. That sounds really energizing to me too, to hear that from you. And I, I can hear the excitement from all the potential opportunities. I think, yeah, I, I definitely think this is a great time within the field because um, people are just more open. Once once everything was closed for so long in whatever capacity, they're like, I, I will try it. Like, let's let's go ahead. Let's Let's take that risk. Absolutely. So then you kind of talked a little bit about your business. You've kind of talked a little bit about your experience. And so one of the big questions that I ask on every episode, and it's kind of like the brand of the episode, is what do you contribute to the world of music therapy slash like how are you innovative? Um, that is definitely a very hard question to answer. <laughs> so focusing on the ways I think I might be a little different from other music therapists in this moment is um, I'm really interested in talking about the labor of music therapists and how valuable it is, but how often undervalued it is in our culture. I think a lot of us, especially when we're new in the profession, we might end up in jobs that are extremely demanding and, and don't actually pay very well. So I feel that even just talking about that might make me kind of innovative because I think a lot of music therapists are really worried about sounding unprofessional by kind of airing some of the problems that come in our fields, you know, professionally, especially in employment by, you know, large agencies or kind of powerful institutions like hospitals and things like that. Um, but I think it's really important to talk about because if we're going to move forward as a profession and trying to be valued higher and, and paid more, I think it's really important that we are talking about it, that we're talking about how we should be advocating for ourselves and moving forward. And I'm also interested in, you know, what's kind of considered professional or not. You know, I, as a queer person, I had a really hard time navigating kind of traditional employment in an institution just because of, you know, how I present and how I look. And I'm interested in the conversation about like self-disclosure in the music therapy field, particularly with being out as a queer music therapist. And I've heard so many different opinions on, okay, should I be out? Should I not be out at work? Is it unprofessional for me to be out? But the truth is that 
you know, straight and cisgender music therapists are out way more than they realize. You know, I hear straight music therapists casually mention their spouse or that kind of thing, right? Oh, my husband. And not that that's wrong at all. I think that that's okay. But I think if that's okay, then it needs to be okay for queer music therapists to also be out because why should that same information for us be deemed unprofessional or inappropriate, right? You know, I, I dyed my hair pink after my internship and before my first job because I was like, this is the only time I'm going to be able to do this. But then I've kept it through these years and I kept it through my traditional job because I really find that being able to express my gender and my identity as a queer person through something like a non-normative haircut is really valuable to me. And I'm kind of not really willing to compromise on that. And I just really want to empower other queer people to know that, you know, the way that you present to affirm your gender is not unprofessional. <laughs> you know, you can look really queer and still look really professional. And so with that, I'm embarking on this journey of private practice, you know, to try to be more independent and to be able to really support myself more on my terms, to be able to create this professional persona that I feel comfortable with and am empowered with. And with that, I'm really trying to bring some colleagues with me. So I've started uh, this like peer group for other queer creative arts therapists who are embarking on private practice. We meet once a month together to just kind of talk about ideas, talk about goals, bounce thoughts off each other, and really keep each other accountable and also motivated and affirmed, you know, by saying like, what we're doing is important, it's needed, we can do this. <laughs> so, so I feel like perhaps that's a little innovative to, I don't know, I'm, I'm, put, I'm trying to put a lot of energy into my colleagues as well as I'm trying to build my, my business. That really is a hard question to answer. I feel like I just went all over the place. No, that was great because you really touched on how you as an individual are being innovative for yourself, how you're pushing the community at large for like music therapy and <clears throat> showing people what it is to be an authentic person um, leading their sessions. But then at the same time, you're also showing how you're supporting other professionals outside of our field. So I think that was a really great all-encompassing description. So it sounds like you're very innovative. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Of course. And actually, that brings us to our topic today for our listeners. So our topic for today is starting your queer business. And so we're going to ask April a ton of questions regarding that. Just starting off, though, would you like us to just uh, would you like to tell us just a little bit about your business specifically, all the thought and like preparation that went into it? Sure. So my business is called Your Song Music Therapy. I chose that name intentionally because I wanted to build a queer business that really caters to the queer community. So your song is a reference to Elton John. I had just seen Rocket Man and was really inspired by Elton John's journey through, you know, substance use and mental health. Also learning more about how collaborative his songwriting process was. Um, I really liked that. And I thought that that was really true to kind of the music therapy relationship of collaborative creation. And I just really wanted to reference a, a queer artist. So that's kind of a little bit about the name of my business. Um, my goal with my business truly is to support my community. You know, I really want to support the queer community, but that's, that's not the only population that I'm interested in working with. I'm really interested in working with everyone. But I really just want to bring music therapy to people as a mental health support. And also I want to be able to just financially support myself and have autonomy over my life. <laughs> so those are really the big motivations behind starting my private practice. I feel like this desire to kind of like have autonomy over your life and to kind of like gain control back over everything is also something that is shared among people of our age right now, especially after COVID. I keep mentioning that, but I, I do think it plays an integral part in like really having every individual reassess where they are and if they like what they're doing and what they want to change. 
So I think though not every one of us has gone into like a private practice, I think that is a shared feeling for a lot of people from like their 20s to their 30s. Absolutely. And I think that a, a big part of that comes from how many of us do enter these kind of traditional nine to five institution roles, which we think, oh, this is my dream job. Oh my gosh, I got exactly what I wanted. This is going to be awesome. But then you find yourself having, you know, especially if you have a commute to your job as well, you find yourself really low on energy for yourself, really low on time for yourself. And, you know, participating in systems, which you might feel you might see harming the same people that you're trying to be assisting. And I think that we often use the word burnout to describe that. But I think that that's not really appropriate because I think that puts a lot of responsibility on the individual of, okay, well, you're not self-caring your way out of this. And I think that that isn't really helpful. I was in a presentation by a colleague, Lauren Milburn. She's a dance movement therapist in Chicago. And she was talking about the same thing. She had just been working in a hospital you know, institution for psych as well. And she was talking about how what she experienced, she called it moral injury, not burnout. She called it a moral injury because you're an employee and part of this big system um, that you see potentially harming your clientele or your patients. And I found that as well. So that, I think that goes beyond burnout. That's not just, oh, I'm hustling too hard and getting tired. It's, oh my gosh, I went into this field to try to be helpful. And now I have to like compromise things that I believe about how people should be treated. And that is resulting in an injury that is deep to me. It's not just I'm tired. It's something that's deeply upsetting to me as a person and what I believe. Yeah. For those listeners who don't work in music therapy or any type of helping profession, and they're just wanting to get more information about it, how would you describe some of those compromises that have to be made or that are commonly made? Yeah, that's a good question. I found that in the setting I was working in, first of all, the funding and the lack of funding, I mean, and the lack of programming that was available to the clientele where I was working was was really alarming. So I was working in acute inpatient psych. You know, we're talking crisis management here, people that are coming in after being a danger to themselves or someone else, right? And they would come in and the only therapeutic service they would get was me and one other creative arts therapist for like one hour each day. And that's it, you know? Um, yeah. And that's, that's not how it is everywhere, of course, but that was my true experience. Right. So, so I'm trying to come in the room and work on things like coping skills. (laughs) I'm trying to work on, you know, group cohesion and stuff like that, but I'm having to spend, you know, half of the group just trying to manage the righteous anger and frustration of the patients on the unit being like, why haven't I seen my doctor in over a day? Why haven't I seen my social worker in over a day? What is going on with my case? You know, um, just kind of like the lack of resources in some of those, especially, you know, kind of nonprofit settings sometimes, which I was, of course, really drawn to that. I was like, oh, I'm so excited to work for a nonprofit. Love that. But After being part of that and seeing how ragged administration will run you in in some of the nonprofits out there, it really doesn't lend you to to do effective and good work with your clientele. And so you're like, okay, why is my time being spent doing this? Why is why why isn't there enough support? Why am I seeing people on this unit get escalated to the point of being restrained, you know, by staff who are burnt out or morally injured and, you know, don't have the patience to communicate with them in a therapeutic way. So, so kind of things like that. And, you know, like I said, that's not how the experience is everywhere, but I definitely know other people who have had similar experiences to that. Why do you think creative arts therapists, maybe that's a big generalization, but why do you think creative arts therapists when entering like the profession 
feel less apt to speaking about these types of unideal situations or moral dilemmas? I think that I think that we feel I think that we're really worried about being taken seriously by other professionals. I think that that is a pretty big concern, um, especially I think in music therapy. And I totally understand that because as a music therapist, I have been, you know, disrespected by other team members who, you know, didn't maybe don't take my work seriously. So I, I definitely understand where that feeling comes from. And so I think for that reason, perhaps creative arts therapists don't want to seem like like they can't complete the job that they signed up for or you know that they're they don't have the clinical skills to carry out the the job that they agreed to because I don't think that that's what's happening either I think we are highly qualified and that we provide incredible services that are unique and and very helpful but I think that we're just really worried about stepping out of line. I think we're worried about looking unprofessional. And also I think in our education, very rarely, very rarely do we learn much at all about how to start your own business and how to be self-employed. A lot of my colleagues that I talked to really never learned about that in school. I know that I didn't really have a very big segment on that in school either. So I think also creative arts therapists feel like they don't have other options, that they kind of need to accept whatever employment opportunities come their way. But that's not true. We do have other options. And in fact, I think being a creative arts therapist kind of gives you the golden ticket to self-employment, especially because we're able, thinking about music therapy and how many, you know, facility visits and home visits we can do, you can start up a business for a really low cost if you don't even have to rent out a space. You know what I mean? So I think, I just think that there's a disconnect between the opportunity that's there and kind of what's presented to us in our education and in our discussions in our fields. What were some of the, the big turning points for you? Or like, what was like the moment where you're like, okay, I don't like what's happening in this setting I'm working in. And this, like, what resources did you turn to What was the turning point and flip of the switch where you were like, I want to go into private practice? I don't want to go in too much detail about what happened in my specific workplace, but I will say that in the particular place where I was working, um, I did not feel physically safe. So there was a, a lack of support by other staff. So I was running these groups for acute inpatient psych with, you know, eight adults in the room that are all going through something, but I would have no support staff in the room. And in fact, some of the support staff from the milieu would like leave (laughs) the unit while I was running group, you know? So, and, and I think that that also just speaks to the reality of how it can be in, in some of these maybe nonprofit settings or just settings where there's not a lot of funding, um, where if all the employees are already feeling like they're stretched too thin, they're not often going to be providing a lot of extra support. So there was an incident where a colleague was assaulted by a patient (laughs) kind of due to a lack of, of staff support. And at that moment, coming in to work in this setting where I felt not only unsupported and underpaid, but then also physically unsafe is what, what kind of pushed me over the edge. And I said, wow, I, I love working in psych. I love the patients that come through here, but this is not sustainable for me at all. And also, you know, to be truly honest, working in that kind of traditional nine to five role with you know, two weeks paid vacation or or that kind of thing. I felt that that really, really didn't work with me. Perhaps it would have worked better if the work setting um, didn't make me feel unsafe. But 
I really value flexibility in my year and, and being able to do different things. So I've worked at a summer camp back home every summer for the past like 10 years. And my first summer at my nine to five job, I could only take off one week to go rather than go for the full month. And it broke my heart to not be able to do this other thing that was really important to me because I just couldn't get the time away from my other job. So I found that that kind of inflexibility of, of that job's demands combined with, you know, not really feeling safe in the work environment, and then combined with the issues that I was feeling as a queer person in that space, where, you know, I didn't really feel supported to be out. And furthermore, I witnessed like our trans patients coming in being treated really bad (laughs) by staff and being like the only person that was advocating for them, which was exhausting, but I'm glad that I could do that. And I, I pushed hard enough that they ended up getting a training there on that because, you know, they were they were putting people, so we had gendered units and they were putting people on the wrong unit, <laughs> calling them by the wrong name, the wrong pronouns, all that. So I would have to say it was really a combination of, of all of those things that made me rethink things. And I, and I did have quite a few people in my life saying that I needed to do something different. Well, it's also great to hear that you took the initiative to remove yourself from that. It sounds like a toxic situation. But it did take me a long time and it was really difficult because I thought, you know, this was my dream job. This is exactly what I wanted. You know, why can't I do this? <laughs> you know, it, it and it was really, really hard for me to leave behind the patients that were there because a lot of folks would be coming in and out often. So it was a really hard decision. I really, really... It, it took me a few months of, of really battling that within myself before I decided to leave. But I have to be honest in saying that my stress levels have been nothing compared to how they were in that job. Like it was really worth it for me to leave that position. And I think this could be a great opportunity for any listeners out there as well. If you are feeling overwhelmed by your work environment, but you've had this like stigma in your head that, hey, this is what I worked my whole life towards. It's okay to get to that point and be like, this is not what I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. And there are other options available. And, you know, there's that idea of, oh my gosh, well, if I leave, then who's going to be here? And, you know, these people still need music therapy services. So I should be here. I should be doing that. But at some point, We have to not take these jobs that don't treat us right or else employers are just going to keep treating us bad. (laughs) You know, we have to stop filling these roles that are, you know, harmful to us because what we have to offer is really important and it's awesome. Some people even end up leaving the field over experiences like that, which is none of us want that, (laughs) you know, None of us go into this saying, oh, I'm going to be a music therapist. It's going to be awesome. You know, want to just leave the field over a bad experience, you know. But again, when it feels like that's kind of the only option, I can see why people feel that way. But but it's really not the only option. There is a variety of things that could be right for you that may not be right for somebody else. I wanted to kind of circle back to when you're mentioning the queer experience in the workplace. I would love to touch on this topic a little bit more and kind of dive in specifically with what are some compromises? I think both you and I know individually, but just to share with others, what are some compromises that you often see like queer individuals and therapists having to make in the workplace? Um, First of all, trying to not be out is... It's a lot more mental gymnastics than people who are not queer understand, I think. Because if someone asks you about your weekend and you're trying to avoid bringing up your partner or something like that, or, you know, I found in my position, people are asking me all the time 
are you married? Do you have kids? And I would just be like, nope. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think it's hard for people to understand if you haven't gone through it, but it's really mentally tiring to stay in the closet because you think about it all the time, you know? And then comes the decision, okay, am I going to be out? If I'm going to be out, who am I going to be out to? You know, so so through through my journey, I've, you know, maybe come out to some coworkers, but then maybe those coworkers, like, say something mm -hmm. about my sexuality, like, on the unit in front of patients, and I don't want it disclosed there. So, so that is really difficult as well. The appearance thing is a really big compromise. I think a lot of queer identified people won't get maybe the hair style that they want or tattoos that they want or things like that because they're worried about how it'll read in the workplace. But I think that that is, that's a really high price to ask. You know, my, my gender expression is a really important part of my wellness as a person and you know as a creative arts therapist as someone that's encouraging creative expression from others putting a mute on your own creative expression of yourself i don't know how that can help the therapeutic relationship at all you know i would also say just you know like i said with mistreatment of like trans patients on our unit it was scary to be the only person kind of advocating in, you know, IDT meetings and that kind of thing. And that was actually kind of how I ended up coming out to my team <laughs> was by my, you know, incessant, you know, correcting of pronoun and names and that kind of thing. I didn't even realize that I came out in one of those conversations, but I did. It was well received, but you just never know how it's going to be. You never know if coming out is going to make your workplace feel less safe or less comfortable to you because you just don't know how people are going to be with it. And that's really tough. Yeah. And I know for some individuals, depending on which setting, like if they're working in private practice, I know for some, they might change their appearance based on the setting or the population that they're with as well. Totally. Which I don't think a lot of people like realize if you're not within the queer community, whether that be like, oh, I'm going to switch these earrings out real quick or I'm going to change this top. Totally. Or I'm going to wear this pin for this setting and not wear it for another. Right. There's mm -hmm. so many ways we signal. And yeah, the appearance bit, I think, is hard for people outside the community to understand because I mean, everyone has to make compromises with how they want to appear in the workplace because what we consider professional is quite rigid in our culture, I think. But I don't want to appear not queer. Like that's really important for me. That's an identity that I had to fight really hard to, you know, love. So I, I don't want to pass as something else. I want to look like me. I want to look like my community. And so not feeling comfortable to do that in the workplace, I think is too big of an ask. So really what I did was I kind of just went against company policy of not allowing dyed hair and I would just do it anyway. Um, and I found that nobody really said anything about it either. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually those are created by like upper management. And so right. they're, they're not really there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to talk more about these topics and continue diving into your private practice right after our commercial break. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Voices of Music Therapy podcast. Today, we are sitting down with April Hickey, and we are talking about queer businesses, creating your own private practice, where the music therapy field at large can grow and where it can be better. And so I'm so excited to dive back into our topic. So April, one of the questions that I was thinking of during the first half of our podcast is where the music therapy just at large is falling short with queer topics and competencies. Yeah, absolutely. There was a pretty big study out in, I think it was 2013, the Whitehead Plu et al. 
study where they surveyed like over 400 music therapists and specifically asked questions about competency with LGBT individuals. And they found that over half of respondents said that they didn't get any training at all in LGBT issues or competencies, and that the majority of them said that they don't they don't feel prepared to work with LGBTQ clients. And that is so wild, especially when we consider that over a third of music therapists provide services to autistic people. And autistic people are more likely than the general population to be LGBTQ. Yeah, so it's like, I think a lot of music therapists think, oh, well, I don't have queer clients. You know, I'm, I'm open to working with queer, queer clients, but maybe I don't have any, but that's just probably not true. If you're working with autistic people, you are probably working with LGBT clientele. And, and that's really true of any group of people. If you're working with seniors, if you're working with teens, if you, whoever, we're everywhere, you know? <laughs> um, so I think that there's a really big disconnect with that. How, how can it be that, you know, so many music therapists don't feel prepared to work with LGBT clients, but they're already working with autistic folks? That, that is a big question that I have in my mind. So I think obviously we do need more education on this topic. I felt when I was completing my music therapy program, I, I minored in women's and gender studies. So I was able to really deep dive into gender and sexuality and things like that. And I feel that that has informed and shaped me as a therapist so much, you know, and, and during my schooling, I was learning so many things. I was like, oh, I cannot believe that my classmates aren't being exposed to the same information that I am, you know, in my minor. So I think that, you know, education is extremely important and powerful, especially because our therapeutic goals can be biased if we don't really examine that. We can really unconsciously be implementing therapeutic goals that are in reinforcing gender norms or things like that with our clientele if we're not really carefully thinking about it. I think that there definitely is a gap. And that is one reason why I think we need more queer clinicians in private practice specifically is because when you're in private practice, I think you have a lot more opportunities to step outside of the purely clinical role of music therapists, and you have more opportunities to be a leader or an educator in your field. Like for example, even doing something like this podcast or presenting, I think I would have been a lot less likely to do as just a clinician. Now that I have moved into private practice, I feel pushed to put myself out there a lot more and to be sharing my ideas and you know, trying to be seen as a resource, not only to the queer community as a music therapist, but I want to also be a resource to other music therapists as somebody who can maybe provide education around queer topics. So that that is definitely a reason why I think there needs to be more of us with autonomy <laughs> in the field to provide these educational services because they're needed. And music therapists who are not queer want them. You know, I, I think that they're are, are many people that are, are will, very willing and they want to learn more. They want to know how to serve their queer clients the best, but there's just not a whole lot of resources out there at this moment. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking when you're referencing the, the Whitehead research that came out, I was also thinking about, you know, how intertwined racial identity and ethnicity is to sexuality and gender and depending on the different cultures. And it's as those conversations are coming up more and more, there's so much intersectionality between these topics that it, it feels very odd that after, after, you know, 50 years since the seventies, we're not still talking about this and actively doing something about it, like within our educational system. Absolutely. And then even from like the music standpoint, our education on queer history is not there. Like, why are we not learning more about the queer black origins of rock and roll? Cause that's who invented it, you know? <laughs> um, why aren't we talking more about how stigmatized disco is because it is a queer black art form? 
you know, there's just so much musically that we need to be talking about from the queer perspective as well that we're not. Also, just thinking about, like you're saying, how how intertwined it is to the queer experience. There's there's artists, for instance, that are associated as like queer icons versus Mm -hmm. individuals who are actively like against queer topics and whether to support them and all all these things but there's so much room there for a discussion and education so when you're talking about like private practice and for those who are starting their own private practice do you think it's harder for a queer business owner to get started than let's say they're like cis straight counterparts or is that what would that look like from your opinion i think maybe yes because i think that Queerness can often come with a lot of imposter syndrome just because, you know, we get so much messaging that we're not right for for so much of our lives that, of course, that's going to transfer professionally. Of course, you're going to feel that as a professional as well, that, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm not a leader. Maybe I'm I just got to take what job I can get or something like that. I think that there's there's definitely some mental barriers there between queer people getting into private practice compared to people who are not queer. I think also just from a privilege standpoint, there's a lot of people that get into private practice in our field that do have help maybe from wealthy family or something like that, which queer people are just you know gonna be less likely to have access to. So there are barriers there as well. And then, of course, there's the issue of representation that we just really don't see very many queer music therapists with private practices out there, um, at least not many that are you know very forwardly out. There are definitely some, but just thinking about who I'm able to follow on Instagram, you know, with with their own music therapy private practices, I, I really don't see a whole lot of a lot of queer people out there. But if you're listening to this and you're a queer private practice owner, please contact me because I would love to find out who you are because I really don't see us, but I, I would like to. So that is, that's one reason why I'm like aggressively out <laughs> with my, my social media for private practice because I think that there's not, not enough of us out there being really out and, and having private practices. And I think that there's also a lack of education on what it really takes to start a private practice because for music therapy we can it it's pretty doable especially if you're willing to you know allow a lot of time to slowly build up and let it grow it's pretty doable if you want to just kind of get things started on the side while you're you know doing something else to pay your bills it's it's more doable i think than people think but there's just a lack of access to information about that. So I think that that is a block. Where did you find the information for that um, within your own research? So I am a member of the Illinois Association for Music Therapists. And a couple years ago, there was a music therapist, Victoria Storm, who did present on, you know, basics of how to start up a private practice. And so I attended that. um, And I actually ended up subcontracting with her a little bit. And that also helped me learn more about private practice. Um, So it was really just going to that CMTE that was about private practice. And I I just went because it was what, you know, my state organization was offering. I was not interested in private practice really at all. I did not believe that that could be a path for me, really. But when somebody just kind of runs through, like, the basic steps you have to take, you know, it's, it's more doable, I think, than people think. So that's a shout out to anybody looking for CMTEs. You might as well get extra credits to continue practicing while learning the skills you want. Absolutely. Um, and then, so I was I was thinking about everything that you're saying. So let's say you you look up those steps, you find out how to create your own private practice, whether that's like an LLC, a nonprofit, et cetera. What are, so then you start serving your clients. And some individuals might want to work exclusively with queer clients and others might want to cast a broader net in order to get more clients off the bat. So turning it to our clients, what are some benefits that our clients could have from having either a queer therapist or a very um, accepting and encouraging um, therapist? That's a really good question. And, you know, I don't believe that only queer therapists should be serving queer clientele. You know, I don't 
I, I don't think that that's true at all. And in fact, you know, there is a lot of therapeutic merit in having maybe somebody who looks like your straight parent, you know, that didn't accept you providing a therapeutic service to you that is affirming. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't have to share that identity to have a worthwhile therapeutic relationship. But I will say that there are a lot of queer people who actively do want a queer identified therapist. So I think that it's really important that we are available to them and that they're able to find us. So I think that having that shared lived experience can be really, really affirming and helpful for clients. I would say especially for clients who maybe don't have a large or very strong queer network in their personal lives, having a queer clinician can really be a tether to community <laughs> for them and, and really create a very safe space for expression for them. So, so again, I don't think that you have to share a marginalized identity with your client to have a positive therapeutic relationship, but there are people that want that and they should be able to access that. And for the organizations, so let's say they they aren't queer and they're reaching out to these clients, what are ways that they can really show that they're accepting and that they are not going to be problematic? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of putting myself in the position if I was looking for a therapist and say I wanted a queer therapist but couldn't find one. I would need for someone to definitely vocally be saying that they are behind not just LGBTQ people, but LGBTQ rights. I need to know that people are, you know, not supporting organizations that are hurting our trans youth and things like that. I need to see that action as well as affirming words, but it, need, it needs to go deeper. So, so that's what I would say. I'd say don't, don't post yourself with some Chick-fil-A or something like that if you're um, trying to attract queer people to uh, your services. Maybe something subtle in the workplace, you know, if, if your whole team goes out to get Chick-fil-A together, Maybe something to reflect on. Yes. <laughs> Maybe look into the history of Chick-fil-A just a little bit. Not specifically like roasting that business because I don't want them to come from my podcast. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but a lot of organizations, it's important to know um, what they support because for queer individuals, we often know, but we're not necessarily going to tell you. Like um, it's it's not something that's constantly on our minds. It's only what we support. So, yeah. Yeah. And something else I'll say is if you are, you know, you have a music therapy agency or something like that, and you want to employ, you know, a queer individual to, to have a queer individual on your team, like they need to be well compensated for bringing that expertise into your business. So I think that that is really important. I saw, um, I was looking at the AMTA 2020 workforce analysis and, you know, that doesn't give us a full picture of what's going on in the music therapy profession, right? Because it's only talking about members um, of AMTA and AMTA is a costly service. So, you know, there might be some people that aren't represented in there who are making lower salaries and things like that. But there is a category salary by work setting and the like private music therapy agency salary, it was not only significantly lower from what music therapy business owners make, which we would expect, right? But it was also quite a bit lower than just the national average salary for full-time music therapists anyway. So that number I found surprising. And again, you know, the, the workforce analysis doesn't paint the clearest picture of things, but um, I think it does indicate that maybe, you know, some practices out there that do have lots of employees, you know, maybe aren't. If the compensation isn't as good as the average, then I don't know. I think private practices have the opportunity to to create a lot of income. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if you're going to be bringing in like team members to diversify your team, just 
you know, be sending sending that money back to them and, and good compensation is really important. I know personally from an employee standpoint, as that compensation increases, so does the willingness to like go the extra mile for those for those companies as well. So absolutely. I mean, I think that's something that like big corporations like Google and like all social media platforms pretty commonly have picked up on is is the better you treat the employees, the better they'll treat the business. And it, it's kind of this circular process. But yeah, if you're asking your queer employees to use their expertise on queer topics, that is a valuable source. Yeah. Especially if they're initiating those services. Definitely. And it's for those listening to, I, I do want to clarify in case this is like a whole new world and topic to you. Um, for individuals who identify as queer, I do think it is important to note as well that you're not treating them for queerness or for anything like that. There are just within the queer experience, a lot of trauma that can happen from being in the closet and not expressing yourself from the environments and the danger that you have based on the cultural norms of the areas you are in. And so it's addressing those types of traumas or anxieties or family situations, not the queerness itself. Right. And I would also say that as music therapists or creative arts therapists at all, we have a superpower of helping people creatively express their true selves. And to a queer person who's had to maybe struggle with that particular skill because of their community or society at large, telling them that who they are is not okay. You know, our ability to provide space for them to creatively express themselves is just so important and can be so healing and so affirming. So I think we're really positioned to be very helpful if we know what we're doing. Absolutely. And those rates for queer individuals, I was looking at the 2020 um, census for the US. So there is some bias there as well. But I do think it's important to know, like earlier we were mentioning how queer people are literally in every population whether it's older adults, individuals with autism or autistic people. And then, um, for instance, just like the homeless shelter, like you were mentioning earlier, trying to get into that population setting, 9% I have on the census of like queer people are unemployed. And then food insecure is like, it says 27%, which I think is really, really high. And I can link that in the show notes below. So you can click that when you're listening and kind of see where I got that from. And income below... 24,000 a year looks like 25% versus the straight counterparts, which is 18%. Wow. So, I mean, there's, there's queer people everywhere, but this is just an example of how identity, whether gender, sexuality, gender expression can really influence your life. And I think that's also a testament to why some people might feel insecure within the workplace because we have like this, this huge stigma in American culture. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of, throw those in to give you a better idea f- for our listeners what what it kind of looks like in our culture. And then going from there, I just wanted to give you the space to mention anything else. If you wanted to plug any other topics or if there's something that we didn't touch on, I would be happy to talk about that for our listeners as well. Absolutely. So I am going to be presenting at this really cool online event on June 26th. Saturday, June 26th, is called Expressing Pride, a celebration of community, connection, and inspiration. It's co-sponsored by the Queer Creative Arts Therapies and Expressive Therapies Summit. It's totally free. Here's a description on it. Enjoy a day of virtual learning, connection, and community building to discover, explore, and honor work done by LGBTQ plus expressive arts therapists and with the LGBTQ plus community, featuring presentations, panels, an affinity group, and discussions. So you can find that. Oh, shoot. I'm not sure where to tell people that they can find it. Is the link that you sent me my email one that they can use? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you can find it in the show notes if you would like to, if you'd like to go and attend. Yeah. So I'm going to be presenting at that event. My presentation title is Why Queer Creative Arts Therapists Should Start Their Own Businesses. And so I'll kind of go more into, you know, what we as queer creative arts therapists have to offer by going into private practice, what private practice ownership can offer to us as individuals and kind of finding autonomy in our lives. And then I'll also share some resources and 
just go over real quick the basics of of what to do to kind of get started in private practice. So I would love if if you join for that. There's amazing presentations all day on this event with some really awesome um, people in the field. I'll also say that I will be launching some educational resources for music therapists who are not queer to learn more about queer things in the next few months. So I'll just say, keep an eye on my social media for that. You can follow me at Your Song Music Therapy on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. I don't have any official dates or anything for that yet, but just keep an eye out because I will be putting some stuff out there. And uh, you can also check out my website, yoursongmusictherapy.com. Well, thank you so much, April, for coming onto the show and willing to share your voice um, on so many important topics that are underrepresented in the music therapy community and creative arts and therapy at large. Thank you so much for having me, Brian, and happy Pride Month. Yeah, happy Pride Month to you too. And for our listeners, don't forget to rate our podcast on Apple Music and listen to our playlist listed in our bio. Subscribe here to new episodes every other Friday. And thank you for listening. If you'd like to recommend a guest or engage with us, you can email us at voicesofmusictherapy at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Voices of Music Therapy. If you'd like to see today's guest or learn more about the show, check us out on Facebook or Instagram at Voices of Music Therapy or on Twitter at VOMT Podcast. If you have any questions or if you know any innovative music therapist and would like to recommend them for the show, you can email us at Voices of Music Therapy at gmail.com.